The Tin Drum, adapted for radio by Mike Walker, with Phil Daniels as Oscar, Kenneth Cranham as Matsurat, and Leslie Manville as Agnes. Episode 1, There Once Was a Drummer. Ladies and gentlemen, we present The Tin Drum by Gunter Grass, in which I, Oscar Matsurat, with only the aid of the aforementioned tin drum, will attempt single-handedly to rescue the past from oblivion. Granted, I am an inmate of a mental hospital. My keeper is watching me. He never lets me out of his sight. There's a peephole in the door, and my keeper's eye is the shade of brown that can never see through a blue-eyed type like me. And you, my friends... My very good friends, will you see through, little Oscar? We will spend some time in each other's company. About 30 years in a world war by my reckoning. Two hours by yours. I drum away the long days and ask all sorts of questions. For instance, I asked my drum whether the bedroom lights were 40 or 60 watts. Why? <laughs> Listen. Alfred? Are you there? 1923, Danzig. My mother was filling blue bags with sugar in the back of the shop. Alfred! She scoops and fills and bends and... Hello? I was just serving Frau Scheffler, my dear. How are you? Not working too hard, I hope. Not filling the bags too full, eh? <laughs> My father, Alfred Matsarat, he's an honest sort of chap. He never really underfills the bags. Oh, Alfred! Just my little joke, Agnes. Oh, Alfred! My dear? <gasps> oh! I beg your pardon. Always so polite. Oh! Baby! Huh? Oh my God! Where's the midwife? Oh. Somebody, quick! My oh. wife's having a baby. Oh. Oh. Now come along, oh. quick, quick, upstairs. Yeah. So, up to the bedroom. Oh. Mum on her back, skirts up, oh. midwife in attendance, and I saw the light. Four sixty-watt bulbs, to be exact. Oh. Oh. We finally separated, my pretty mama and me. Boy here, Matsuri. You have a son. A boy. You'll take over the shop when he grows up. Oh, Agnes, my love. Not that I wanted to leave the womb, mind you. Oh, Alfred, my dear. At last, we know why we've been working our fingers to the bone, my love. Oh. Well, who does? I knew it would be a boy. Agnes. When Oscar is three, he will have a toy drum. Oscar. What? Yeah, I, I like that. Oscar. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I lay watching a moth dart between the bulbs, casting a huge shadow, its wings beating as if it had to unburden itself. Oh, look, a nasty moth. <sighs> Alfred, my love, perhaps you could call Jan. He will want to know our good news. <clears throat> oh, no visitors yet. And certainly not that pole, not in this house. Jan? Jan Bronski. He will certainly want to hear the good news. But you will have to wait to hear more of Jan. Well, of course, my love. I will fetch him at once. Oh, such a big moth. Let me squash it for our happiness. Back in a moment, my love. Yeah. I have heard rabbits, foxes and dormice drumming. Drummer boys and drum majors. I have heard brown shirts and jazz and the Berlin Philharmonic. I might even mention my own small efforts in the field. But that moth was my master. And as I lay there thinking, thus will it be for 60 or 70 years until a short circuit in the brain turns off the last light. It was only the moth drumming that stopped me expressing my desire to return to the womb at once. And the fact, of course, that the midwife had cut my umbilical cord. So, there was nothing more to be done. I might as well come right out with it. 
I was one of those clairaudient infants whose mental development was complete at birth and after that merely needs a little filling in. So, I am born. But how did this come to be accomplished? A little confusing, huh? Well, that's the way it is with the past. Gets hazy. We forget. We invent. If you really want to know how it is, let's begin at the beginning. Danzig, 1918. A city perched on the borders of Germany and Poland. A free city, owned by neither, desired by both. And here, pretty young Agnes Koliatchek sits beside her handsome cousin, Jan Bronski, as they look through his stamp album. Now, this one here. Mm, this one, Jan. <laughs> this one, Agnes, comes all the way from Iceland. <gasps> Is it worth a lot, this tiny little piece of paper? The most valuable thing I possess. The most? Well, since you ask, there is this other little bit of paper. What's that? My exemption. The army turned me down for another year. <coughs> so, if I were to sell this little stamp and buy something pretty for my Agnes... <laughs> <laughs> this before your very ears is the first, and I truly believe, the sweetest embrace between my mama and her handsome chestnut haired. Yeah. Enough. Unlike Cousin Yan, pretty Agnes was doing her bit for the war effort. She was a nurse, and brave, jolly Sergeant Alfred Matsarat from the Rhineland was wounded. Good day to you, Sergeant. How are we this morning? Uh, wait, hold on. I've got a good one for you, oh. nurse. You'll love this one. <laughs> I'd love it if you do what you were told by the doctor. Hey, this dressing's coming off. You've been asked. No, no, wait, look. Uh, there's this officer type. Real <laughs> Prussian, right? Oh, look, just move a little, Sergeant, yeah. so I can at least change your dressing. And this Bavarian lad, real country bumpkin, comes up to the line, and the mm. Tommies, they're chucking over 50 oh. kinds of... Oh, come <laughs> on with you, Sergeant. And the Prussian, he says, Did you come up here to die, my man? <laughs> oh, no, says the lad. I come up yesterday. <laughs> that does you good to laugh, eh? Well, it's the best medicine, Sergeant. You'll be going home soon if you leave your dressing alone. Well, I don't know. Reckon I, I like what I've seen of Danzig. I might stay around. You haven't seen a thing. I've seen you, Nurse Agnes. And then the Great War ended. The Allies split the free city of Danzig in half between Poland and Germany. Alfred, safe and jovial, opened up his German shop whilst Jan, dashing romantic, opted for Poland the Free and joined the Polish post office. And Agnes, pretty Agnes, opted for... Oh, oh. oh. Honest Al Matsarat. And Jan, he got married. Some say on the rebound. And others say that nothing changed at all between the cousins. As the years tapped and wrapped their way, and I was born, as you know, to 60 watts and the sound of a moth, and in time, arrived at my third birthday. You remember, Mama, what she said? Just as I always promised, darling Oscar. So you did, my dear. So you did. He'll be a little soldier. Now, let's put the string round your neck, my little man. That's it, son. Hold the sticks with a good, firm grip mm. and away you go. No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> what did I tell you? A regular musician. Oscar will be a drummer. A quick learner. There's not much Oscar doesn't see, even though he never says a word. I hope he doesn't see everything. And so, on with a birthday party. Just make you want to dance, yeah. I always want to dance. 
<laughs> oh, Ian, you mustn't. Oscar? He's quite happy with his drum. He's so sweet. What a little man he is. <laughs> Thank you, Yan. And do you think you might take your hand from under Mama's skirts? Where are the others, for goodness sake? Alfred? Yes? Alfred, are you coming through to join us? We want to play cards. I'm cooking, my love. <laughs> what are you cooking up for us, old chum? <laughs> Wild mushrooms, eggs and tripe. <laughs> Good, huh? <laughs> Good German food. That's the stuff we give the troops, right, Alfie? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Vaguely improvising with my drum, I wandered out of the room, down the corridor, where I found the trap door to the cellar had been left open by Matsurat when he brought up some tin fruit for the birthday party. Won't be long now. Have the Shefflers arrived yet? Uh, not yet, my dear. Or the Greffs. Herr Greff says he's looking to enrol Oscar in his scout troop as soon as he's old enough. No, dear. Nobody's come yet. <laughs> Don't worry, things, old chum. A tasty dish needs care and attention. It was a moment before I realised what the trapdoor demanded of me. Of course, no harm must come to the drum. I went down the steps and placed it at the bottom and climbed up. One, two, three, four steps. Five, no. Not high enough yet for a decent bruise. Six, seven, eight. Nine and ah, 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 ah. have I reached the bottom yet? No. Ah, ah, ah. What's that? Alfred Maserat, have you killed my baby? I had hit a shelf filled with bottles of raspberry syrup, and as I lay there, looking up, wondering if it was the raspberry syrup or my blood which smelled so sweet. You murderer! You killer! How could you do it? Do what, my love? Leave the trap door open. I'll never forgive you with my little boy dying. No, no, there, there, Agnes, please. It'll be all right. Oh. Well, shall I call my wife and sit with you? Please, calm down. Oscar! Oscar! What have I done? And so, with a single fall, not without gravity, but with its degree calculated by myself in advance, I not only supplied a reason for my failure to grow another inch, I also transformed our cheery, good-natured Matsarat into a guilty Matsarat. How could you? My oh dear. Never. I'll never, ever forgive you. And this, my dove, my love. Don't take it like a man, chum. How is the lad? Oscar? Thank God. My baby. Pure Danzig Oak. On my first day as a drummer, I had given the world a sign of wonders to come. My fall brought me three months in hospital. When I was released, I stopped growing and I began to drum. <laughs> Upstairs and down, four flights I marched. From Laversweg to Max Halberplatz. Thence to... Marienstrasse, Kleinhammer Park, Fröbel Green. And back again, always drumming. Laversweg via the Polish post office. The drum seems to be standing up quite well under the strain. The local kids think he's a little bit strange, you know. Didn't bother me a bit. Well, you won't have to put up with it for long, old chap. Little Oscar will soon be right through the tin. Ah, sharp edges there, son. You cut yourself if you're not careful. Here, have some chockey and give the nasty old drum to Papa. Nasty old drum? Yes. They wanted to take it away from me. Better give it to your Papa, eh, Oscar? It's no good anymore, is it? You could have a sailboat. Or a kite. Come along now, Oscar. Give it to Papa. OK. You asked for it. Once again, I knew, somehow, exactly what the situation demanded of me. <sighs> I opened my mouth and emitted a thin scream of protest. Which, quite suddenly, shattered the face of the clock. Oh, oh my God, the oh clock my... is broken! Oh. It was just the glass. However, since I started... Oh, no! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! What's happening? Hello? 
wine bowl. Sixty oh. what? Oh, love of God, who's taking away the sin oh, of the world? No, 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 not the wine glass. Oh, yes. Oh, this is an enormous, this is All right, you can keep the drum. After all is said and done, shards of glass are good luck. I decided that I would have to limit this new talent since I was an admirer of fine glassware. However... I was uh, passing by Sigmund Marcus's toy shop the other day uh -huh. and I happened to see in the window... Anything, please. ...a new tin drum, just like Oscar's. So what do you say, little Oscar? Shall we go and see Herr Marcus? Oh. It did gain the desired end. A new drum. I even took it to school on my first day, which also happened to be my last. It was all too big, and there was far too much glass around anyway. And Mama and Papa, well, they had tried, hadn't they? And their little six-year-old Oscar, who hadn't grown an inch since his third birthday... Trap door, you left it open, didn't you? Oh, my dear. You were in the cellar, weren't you? Oh, well, my dear. And so on. But if they and the big world decided to leave me alone, I was left with a little problem all of my own. How was I going to learn to read if I wasn't going to school? I tried Greengrocer Greff, a decent sort of chap who ran the local scout troop. It seemed to me he might well have an interest in the education of a boy. I even left my drum at home as I ventured in amongst the cabbages and innocently picked up a magazine which featured half-naked youths who were, for some reason, chasing a ball round a beach, exhibiting oiled and glistening muscles. Now, come along, young fella, me chap. Those books cost good money. And besides, you can't make Edna tail of it. You're too little, Oscar. And to be honest, not much of an advert for German youth. Yeah. If you want to play, there's plenty of potatoes and cabbages. He offered me potatoes? No. What I needed was someone who appreciated my size. What a little sugar plum baby. Oh, well, great and just lovely little piece of sweetie pie. Lovely, lovely little sugar baby boy. Gretchen Scheffler. <sighs> I'll crochet you such lovely warm mittens with lace and ribbon and lots and lots and lots of little kisses in cross stitch. Mm -hmm. Gretchen, the baker's mm -hmm. wife, in her stifling, tiny, cosy, crowded, bijou sitting room full of knitting, crochet, embroidery, plaiting, knotting, lace work, soft animals with big eyes, dolls, plump lace cushions, full, in short, of everything sugary except... Look what I've got in my little cupboard for my little sugar plum baby. <laughs> exactly. A sugar plum baby. That is until Oscar made his timely appearance to model... Baby jackets, baby pants. Baby bibs and baby shoes and little baby vests. Mm. A friend of Mama's. They used to belong to the same book club until Mama gave up reading for Jan Bronski and sold her books. Not that Gretchen had a library exactly. A volume of Kohler's Naval Calendar, Goethe's Elective Affinities and a curious and copiously illustrated volume called Rasputin and Women. Pink? Booties or the blue? Oh, I do so want to try the pink, and I know you won't mind me, my little baby girly whirly. Oh, you want to play with the big old book? Gurgle, gurgle, <laughs> legs in the air, simper, simper, and. It's all about that naughty Rasputin. I don't think baby should look at these naughty, naughty pickies. Wine, wine, snivel, struggle, rashu, rashu. You get the picture. And so did I. And, more important, got the big and little letters. Oh, well, I don't suppose it matters. You can't read after all. You're only a little baby. <laughs> now, these sweetie pie rompers are going to be just so pretty on my baby. You know, 
It's not easy learning to read while pretending to be a backward child. Even harder than wetting the bed every night. There you just have to present material proof every morning. But to play the ignoramus, to conceal my progress from all around me, meant a constant struggle with my intellectual pride. <sighs> Mama was happy for Gretchen to have me. After all, it left her afternoons free. Though sometimes she dropped in and she and Gretchen would chat and... Oscar is very quiet with you, Gretchen. He loves to look at the books, Agnes. Oh, but this is... Oh, <laughs> Rasputin, yeah. <laughs> Brutal Russian beast who preyed on helpless women. Ah, ah, the lovely young Grand Duchess clasped the filmy peignoir to her swelling white bosom. As the door to her bedroom was wrenched open and there framed in the flickering candlelight, his hairy naked chest bursting from his cassock. Oh, oh. Ripping the lace aside, he rained fiery kisses on the alabaster flesh of her tender rosy tip. Breasts. Oh. Take me, you brute, she moaned. Take me like a common peasant girl in the straw of the pigsty. <gasps> Crushing oh. her to his chest, he cried, Natasha, hear how my heart beats only for you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure that little Oscar doesn't understand? Oh, don't be silly. You can't imagine how hard I work over him. He just doesn't learn. My honest opinion is that he'll never be able to read. Would you like a cup of tea? Some days I varied things a bit and learned from Goethe. And what I learned was that every Rasputin is balanced by a Goethe. Or, if you prefer, every Goethe draws a Rasputin in his wake, or even makes one, in order to be able to condemn him later on. So it goes. So it goes. Every Thursday, Mama went into the city. She always took me along when it became necessary to buy a new drum at Sigmund Marcus toy shop. At that time, between my 7th and 10th birthdays, I was running through a drum every two weeks, so I got to know the place pretty well. Or as poor old Siggy would say... Hey, you're looking pretty good, kid. Real smart today, Frau Metz, that your little lad. Oh, why, thank you, Herr Marcus. Oscar always enjoys a visit to your shop. <laughs> Mama in her rust-coloured autumn suit, with her pretty figure which was beginning to become pleasingly plump. And you, Frau Metzeret, if you don't mind the fella saying, are looking a real stunner today. Oh, now, Herr Marcus. <laughs> and it just so <laughs> happens that I got me mitts on another load of silk stockings. Oh. Brand new, half price, but to your lovely self, a gift. Oh, <laughs> that's so sweet. Of you, Herr Marcus. Ain't it just. So I, I wondered if you'd care to... Yeah? Look after little Oscar whilst he chooses his new drum. I've ah. got a couple of errands to do. Yeah. You may leave the little lad in my capable hands, dear lady, ah. whilst you attend to your important affairs. Thank you, Herr Marcus. Where else would I have had the chance to play seven drums? Whilst Mama played the game of the two-backed beast in a seedy hotel with Jan Bronski and Marcus. Poor hand dog Marcus tormented himself behind the counter. Not bad, young Oscar. That's getting good. <laughs> That's it. Give it a good beating. Hey, where are you off to? Not going out. Oscar, wait. Wait, Oscar, I promised you. Oh, oh, Jack, oh, down there, laddie, you might get food on. Oh, I'll take you across the road. Just your money, have you? Oh, well, please yourself. That's the old stock term. Castle keep. No, no, hold on. You can't go in. There's only allowed kiddies in there. Now, now, come back, son. It's not safe. Now, you, you can't go up the tower. It's not allowed. Higher and higher Oscar climbed, until his legs were exhausted. And yet, even so, he could have climbed forever. But the winding staircase gave up first. And he was out on the top, and he understood in a flash the futility of building towers. Looking down on the world that usually I looked up to. Looking across the rooftops to the Stadt Theatre, with its acres of glass on the roof, on the walls. Well, like the glass, the situation was clear to me. I screamed. It's 
The admirers of my art made no particular impression on me. It was the art of long distance screaming itself which concerned me. I was just getting ready to send a very special scream across the city, in the lobby, through the keyhole, into the empty theatre and up, up to the chandelier, when I looked down and saw Mama and Jan Bronski saying their fond farewells. It was time I got back to Marcus's shop, where I found Mama. Frau Mozart, you've got to listen to me. And Herr Marcus. Please, Herr Marcus, I, I cannot... On his knees. Don't do it no more with that Bronski. He's a pole. It sticks out a mile. Herr Marcus, you must... Then don't bet on the pole. If you've got to bet on someone, bet on the Germans. They're coming up. What's going to happen when they're on top and you're still betting on Bronski? Listen to me, uh, Agnes. Herr Marcus! I can't help it. I'm desperate. And I've just been baptised. So bet on Marcus and we'll clear off to London. I mean, you can despise me if you want. Do anything you want, but don't bet on Bronski. Look, little Oscar. We can take him too. Live like a prince he will. New drum every day, two a day, three, four. Thank you, Marcus. But you see, it's quite impossible on account of Bronski. Yeah, yeah, that's what I reckoned all along. On account of Bronski, you couldn't do it. So, just promise me one thing. Stick by Alfie Mazzarat. You got him already, so don't never swap him for no Polak. On account... Of Bronski. My drum makes me remember that Thursday afternoon all those years ago, and I look for Poland, the land which is now lost to the Germans. And how do I look? With my drum? Or with my soul? But what is my soul? And now, well, I can't put it off any longer. It's simply no good turning over in my bed, shutting my eyes and listening to the cries of the other lunatics. It is time to introduce the master, Bebra. The circus. We went, Mama, Papa, Uncle Jan Bronski, his wife and their children. Oh, didn't I mention the fact that Jan had two kids? Well, he never did, so why should I? We saw acrobats and lion tamers and strong men and clowns. Bebra, the musical clown who played Jimmy the Tiger on Empty Bottles and directed a group of Lilliputians. Yes, a man barely four inches taller than I was. A man, a clown. We met. We had to meet, of course, after the show, when I became detached from Mama and her two cavaliers. He was in braces and slippers, carrying a pail. Our eyes met as we passed. Will you take a look at that? Nowadays, it's the three-year-olds that decide to stop growing. Huh. Can't cut your tongue, young man. Well, my name is Bebra, directly descended from Prince Eugene, whose father was Louis XIV. On my 10th birthday, I made myself stop growing. Oscar Mazzarat. Well, my dear Oscar, I'd say you're 14 or 15 or maybe 16, am I right? I'm nine and a half. You don't mean it. Well, well, and what about me? How old do you think I am? Um, 35. <laughs> Flatterer! I haven't seen 35 in a good few years. In August, I shall be 53. I could be your grandfather. I liked your act, Bebra. I thought it was funny. And I like the music, too. Why, thank you, Oscar. I can do tricks. Can you now? See those coloured light bulbs? Yes. Oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> ah, bravo! Bravissimo, Oscar! You have found your vocation. Your audience waits. Sign on the dotted line. Join the suck. Not me, Mr. Bebra. I just want to watch. My dear Oscar, believe an experienced colleague. Our kind has no place in the audience. We must perform. We must run the show. If we don't, it's the others who'll run us. And they don't do it with kid gloves. They're coming. 
They will take over the meadows where we pitch our tents. They will organize torchlight parades. They will build rostrums and fill them, and they will preach our destruction. Take care, young man. Always to be sitting on the rostrum and never to be sitting in front of it. Oscar! Oscar! They're looking for you, my friend. We shall meet again. We are too little to lose each other. Little people can always find a place, even on the most crowded rostrum. And if not on it, then under it. So says Bebra. Farewell. Oscar, where have you been? He caused us quite a turn, son. He's been with the midgets. And that gnome kissed him on the forehead. I hope he doesn't mean anything. <laughs> what a funny little chap. No, I'm sure it didn't mean anything. It meant a good deal. That kiss. He was right. The era of torchlight processions and parades past rostrums had begun. I took Bebra's advice. Mama took Marcus's advice to the extent that, though she kept on meeting with Bronsky, she placed her bets on Matsurat, who joined the party, took down the picture of Beethoven which hung over the piano and put in its place the Führer, Adolf Hitler. <sighs> Ah, these boots be the death of me. Oh, let me help, Alfred. You mustn't be late. Of course. And once he was out of the house, who would come calling? I'll take little Oscar. You know how he loves the drummers of the Hitler Youth. Puh! Amateurs. The lot of them. Such a pity Herr Greff says he's too small to join them. You're looking very smart, Alfred. Well, I can't let the party down. Big parade today. Speaker from Party mm. HQ. Come along, come along. You mustn't be late. Remember... Lateness is un-German. Let me do your belt. Oh. Righty-ho, my little soldier. Off we go. Oh. Hello, Jan. Alfie, old chap. Just passing by. I thought I might pop in to uh, uh, deliver a recipe that my wife promised Agnes. Come in, Jan. Um, don't, don't be too late back, Alfred. Be good, Oscar. Come on up, Corporal. How are you doing? There wasn't, as it turned out, any room on the rostrum for little Oscar. So whilst Matsarat joined his comrades, I crept underneath it. I sat with my eye to a knot hole watching the crowd, waiting with them for the parade. Company! What? For the Fuhrer! For Germany! They were coming, they were coming, with their grim trumpetings and soulless drumming. Now, my people, hearken unto me! I gave them a waltz. I thought that I would have no effect then. What are you doing, you fools? What is this? The crowd loved it. They danced. How they danced. Led on by my drum. Looking, lads. If there are communist saboteurs hiding anywhere, I want them found, and then we'll kick the crap out of scum. Insulting Germany, the filth. Corporal Max Rook, what are you doing? I thought you'd gone home. Uh, Sergeant Greff, I'm looking for a little Oscar. You haven't seen him, have you? I haven't got time to look for infants. Here. You don't think the Polacks had anything to do with the disruption? The Poles? Yeah, shifty load of bastards. The sooner we kick their asses out of Danzig for good, the better. Don't you worry, Matsura. The Fuhrer's got their number. Come on, lads. Let's find the bastards. Oscar! Oscar! Where have you got to, son? I should never let you come. When we got home at last, there was meatloaf with boiled potatoes and red cabbage and chocolate pudding with vanilla sauce. On the whole, it was a, well, quiet afternoon. Mm. And you, my love? Oh, well, quiet, too. Did you, um, Jan stay for long? No, no, not long. I was chatting to Sergeant Greff mm. about the Polish question. 
Is there a Polish question, Alfred? People seem to think so. Oh, what people? Oh, just people. Well, maybe they should mind their own business and leave the Poles alone. What? Some people say I'm a... I, I just pass it on for interest, my love, that the Poles should leave Germany alone and stop trying to take what does not belong to them. Danzig is divided between Poland and Germany. Everyone knows that. Ref says that Danzig may have to decide what she wants to be. And sooner rather than later. Oh, those Nazis! The atmosphere was heavy. Until a refreshing storm broke with a fine drum solo of hail. Was I influenced by Bebra? Do I consider myself a freedom fighter because I disrupted a few Nazi parades? Did I wish, as my little master suggested, to stand upon the rostrum in front of the crowd? Or in dark doorways on city evenings? Well, everyone knows that evil always lurks in dark doorways. Though I say that I never had any desire to tempt rather to help my fellow citizens to know themselves. See? A dark street. The magic surface of a shop window, glowing in the darkness. And passing, shall we say, a gentleman who pauses, looks in the window at a ruby and gold necklace nestling on black velvet. And Oscar sends forth his softest cry and makes a hole through the magic glass, just big enough for a hand holding a necklace. Will he? Won't he? And the others who passed my dark doorway in those years of 1936 and 7, who paused as circles of glass fell from windows, who found the way open to a silk burgundy necktie, a box of Monte Cristo, pearl earrings, or a jewelled mirror, would they succumb? The insurance companies found themselves under considerable pressure. So did little Oscar when Matsarat looked at him in that knowing way, and Mama said, It's the fault of that dreadful midget who kissed Oscar on the forehead. I knew no good would come of it. And yet she accepted the gold and ruby necklace from handsome, too handsome Jan Bronski. Though she only ever wore it for him, and perhaps sometimes for me, and as for their questions, I just drummed and drummed and... Well, I'll put up the sign. <laughs> Closed for Good Friday. So, what are we going to do with ourselves? We should go to the seaside for the day. Well, what about your wife? Yeah? Oh, she's going to see her mother, so I have the day free. My treat. We'll take the tram and get some sea air. Agnes is looking distinctly peaky. <sighs> You're not looking after this wife of yours, Alfie. <laughs> Are you ill, my love? I'm fine. Though a day by the sea would be nice. Blow away the sad thoughts. Sad, my love? Oh, I don't know. Somehow I feel gloomy. See, here's what you need. Oscar, drum us to the tram stop, my little soldier. That's certainly bracing. Mama wore a light blue spring coat with raspberry facings. Be careful, Agnes. She had trouble walking in her high heels on the uneven ground. Jan took her arm. I said, what's that chap over there then? Matsarat unbuttoned his shabby old overcoat. Is he fishing? Jan sported a fashionable new coat with a resplendent velvet collar. I haven't got a rod. This is the clothesline. Hello. Uh, good day, you folks. Good day for it. I don't know about that. Well, good luck anyway. Come on. Hold on, my dear. It's chilly out here. How come you're fishing without a rod? What you got down there, eh? He stuck his pipe between tobacco-stained stumps and started to pull on the rope. Hand over hand <sighs> over hand. What I've got. Alfred, I want to go. I suppose we takes a look. I'm not, I'm not feeling well. Alfred, yeah. Over hand. Here it comes. We flung a great living lump of something down in front of us. A horse's head, cut off perhaps only yesterday. There you go. What do you think of that? Oh! From the horse's head darted hundreds of small light green ears. Oh! Oh, for God's sake! Jan, get it away! We just shove these little buggers in the sack, then all I has to do is rip open the jaw. And I can squeeze out the big juicy buggers. 
Jan was frightened of the gulls that gathered over us and protected his blue eyes, ignoring Mama. Matsarat, a man's man, laughed along with a the fisherman. Though when he pulled an enormous eel from the horse's ears, followed by a mess of white porridge from its brains. Bloody hell, mate. Yeah, lovely grub, throw you up a tree. <laughs> right, right, well, nothing like a, a good eel. Please, please, someone. It was Jan who led her away whilst Matsarat chatted with the fisherman like they were old mates. I hope you don't expect me to eat those things, Alfred. Come on, pussycat. You've always known how to catch eels. Never stopped you eating them before. Oh, oh come on. You'll love them once yours truly's cut oh, them up. I'll never touch fish again. Not as long as I live. And yet... And yet... Good Friday was hardly over before Oscar's passion began. And exactly two weeks after Easter, Mama began eating fish. Devouring fish in such quantities without a thought for her figure. That Matsarat said, For goodness sake, stop eating so much fish. Nobody's making you do this, my dear. I don't want you to do it. She started at breakfast on canned sardines. Two hours later, One sack sprats. For lunch, I want fried flounder with mustard sauce. Halfway through the afternoon, it was out with a can opener. Eels and jelly, roll mops, herring. And if Matsarat refused to buy any more fish, Here. Here, I got some smoked deals when I was out. And that was it for our appetite, mm. as she ate every bit, oh. scraping the last particle of fat from mm. the inside of the eel's skin with her knife. Mm. Well, what is it with you? Maybe you're <laughs> pregnant or something. <laughs> Don't talk nonsense. Oh. And when I saw Mama and Yan sitting together on the sofa, I was struck by Yan's tear-stained eyes and an emptiness in her which could only be filled by enormous quantities of fried, boiled, preserved, or smoked fish. And then... Oh, for God's sake, why didn't you want the child? What does it matter whose it is? Or is it all on the count of that bloody horse he said? I wish to go and never gone. Can't you forget it, Agnes? I didn't do it on purpose. The doctor spoke of jaundice and fish poisoning. And, well, she is in her third month, Herr Matsalat. Will she? We just don't know. Oh, God. Agnes. She tried to make her visitors happy. But she showed a face devastated by pain and nausea. And she could not stop herself vomiting until there was nothing left to come from that wasted body except the last bit of breath. <laughs> The nurse closed Mama's eyes because Matsarat and Bronsky were blind with tears. I could not weep. It seemed as though she had been searching for years for a way to break up that triangle and leave Matsarat with the guilt and Yan with the thought. She died for me. I didn't want to stand in my way as a Polish patron. She sacrificed herself. And I, Oscar, I drummed to recreate her grey-eyed beauty. I was almost 14. I loved solitude. I used to walk around the city carrying my drum as usual, but drumming with care. Now that Mama was gone, the supply of new drums had become problematic. It must have been the summer of 38. I was passing the Four Seasons Cafe, when who should I see but my old friend and master. Debra, my dear young friends. How long is it? Four years? Come, come, come and join us at our table. If you don't mind. Allow me to introduce my lovely companion, Roswitha Raguna, the most celebrated somnambulist in all Italy, a jewel in miniature. Very pleased, Signora. Oh, look at the midgets, aren't they cute? The pleasure is mine, Oscar. Bebra has spoken of you. But you don't seem happy, my little glass killer. What's wrong? Is the glass unwilling or has the voice grown weak? Not at all. 
The window there, the big one. No, no, friend Oscar. <laughs> Let us have no more destruction. I wasn't thinking. I'm so sorry. But you are still sad. My mama died. She shouldn't have done that. They say a mother sees all, forgives all, but that's just not true. To mama, I was never anything other than a gnome. She would have got rid of me if she could, but she couldn't. Kids, even gnomes, are marked on your papers. Besides, I was her gnome, and to destroy me would have been to destroy part of herself. So sad. She must have said, it's either me or the gnome, and I am here. And she sleeps in Brentow Cemetery. Ah, you exaggerate, my good friend. You are angry with your dead mama. You feel humiliated because it wasn't you, but those dreary lovers who sent her to the grave. You're vain and wicked, just as a genius should be. After all, it isn't easy for people of our size to get through life, to remain human without external growth. What a task! What a vocation! Ah, carissimo Oscar Nello. How well I understand your grief. Come with us. Visit Milano, Parigi, Toledo, Guatemala. Could I? Is it possible? Rosvita will be your mama. Rosvita can see into the very soul. I see and... Oh, oh Lord, save us. God, save us from... Oh. What is it? What is wrong? Your genius may be divine, my friend, but I fear the diabolical elements have confused Rosvita. You have within you a violence which even I, Bebra, descendant of Ebrus, find... Ah, but join us all the same, if you wish. With a little self-discipline, you should be able to find an audience even under the present political conditions. Does this mean that you no longer stand on the rostrum? That you are in the audience too? I have failed. How can I be your teacher when language itself has been taken over by such as Joseph Goebbels and Herr Hitler? How filthy these politics are! Then, goodbye. We shall meet again. People like us don't lose each other. Forgive your fathers, Oscar. Farewell. Farewell. No matter how careful you are, a tin drum will always wear out. And then you'll just have to get a new one. But how? Matsarat was mourning. Jan Bronski hardly ever visited. It was up to little Oscar. So, one day when Matsarat took me to look at the ruins of a burnt-out synagogue, I slipped from his, to tell the truth, loose grip and hurried off, down street and lane, to the shop of my old friend and supplier. Sigmund Marcus. Oh. So you see, I too had met my masters in the glass killing business. Right, lads! Get in there and trash the place! This Jew boy's going out of business! Right now! Come on! Get me down! They enjoyed their games. Smashing toy yachts and little monkeys which clashed their cymbals when you wound them up. Cutting open pretty dolls and then throwing them away like they were disappointed that only stuffing and sawdust came out. That's the way, boys! Do Marcus won't be polluting German youth with his filthy toys anymore! <laughs> they had so much fun that they thought they'd go and see Marcus himself. Hello, Siggy. He sat behind his desk. Dandruff on his shoulders showed that his scalp was in bad shape. Ah, oh, come on, Jew boy. Don't be shy. I'd join in the fun, why don't you? But Marcus was beyond being spoken to, being hurt or humiliated. Before him stood an empty glass. The sound of his breaking shop window had made him thirsty, no doubt. I drum seldom, and only in cases of absolute necessity. But by summer 39, the object which hung against my belly was a pitiful wreck, rusty and full of gaping holes. The red and white lacquer nearly gone. The sound? I simply had to get another drum. So I waited for Jan Bronski outside the Polish settlement. I waited for days and weeks over that summer of 39. A ragged ass three-year-old with no one to take care of him now. Until... 
Oscar, what on earth are you doing here? Got a message from Atzerat? Well, he knows we can't meet up anymore, the way things are. No, it's not that. I looked up at him, and he saw in my eyes, his eyes, and Mama's eyes, and then he saw my drum. <laughs> well, well, my little soldier. Looks like your drum's been in the wars too. You want it mended? Is that why you've come to see your old Uncle Yan, eh? Well, I know just the man for the job. At the post office, that's right, where I work. Our janitor could yell at his tops at this kind of job. He'll have it right again in a jiffy. Come on. As we cross town, we pass little groups of home guards and SS men, and in front of the post office, for some reason we couldn't work out, there was a whole group of them. Come along, Oscar. My boss is up there in the post office. I simply can't let him see me being stopped by this rabble. I might have made it plain that I felt retreat to be our best option. The SS might have been a lot of things, but they were deadly serious. Come along, hurry up. Let's get inside. So, you've decided to join us, Jan. A few of the men reckoned you wouldn't want to get your shirt cuffs mucky doing anything so inelegant as actually fighting for Polish freedom. What? Uh, resisting Nazi aggression. What do you mean? We, uh, we are about to declare our independence. Oh, God. Oscar, what have you got me into? I'm a soldier. You are now. A steady men, keep up a regular fire. Remember, we are Poles. I was lost in the confusion. For days, nights, I wandered, whilst they fought. And Jan Bronski, I'm sorry to say, kept his head down and his hands over his bright blue eyes. However, at the back of a shelf, in a room at the top of a building, dislodged by a shell, Oscar found a brand new tin drum. Whatever did I do to deserve this? I tried to communicate some of my customary calm to Yan, but terror had invaded him. And then <laughs> I found a bag of cards. We can all have a game of scare. It's like we used to, eh, Alfie? What about it, Agnes? Any cards, yeah? I found a drum. Yan found safety in a pack of cards. They brought up howitzers. It won't last much longer now. It's all over! Come on, get your hands up! Get out here! It's all greater Germany now, mate! So you can haul that flag down! A three-year-old child was found in the rubble clutching his little tin drum. His tear-stained face. His pleading blue eyes ensured his immediate removal to a place of safety. I saw Yan climbing into a truck with other patriots. He lifted a hand and gave me a sad but cheery wave, still holding a pack of cards as he was driven away. That's how Oscar tells it, but I can see I'll have to do better. Move it along, you bloody Polacks. We've had enough trouble for one day. Bloody patriots. Fewer knows how to deal with those lot. And Oscar, concerned for his own comfort and safety, made up to two friendly SS men. What? Put on an exhibition of pathetic snivelling and pointed at Jan Bronski with an accusing gesture. Kidnapping a German <laughs> kid to hide behind that. <laughs> got full house. They began to kick poor Yan and beat him with their rifle butts. Even today I recall my disgusting behaviour with shame. But then I comfort myself that Yan was so preoccupied with his cards that nothing could distract him. Not the boots of the German soldiers, nor the wall against which they stood him a few days later. Not the bullets that tore through his once elegant coat with a velvet collar and into his ardent heart. <sighs> September the 1st, 1939. Even when I am most sorry for myself, I cannot deny it. It was my drum. No, 
It was I, myself, Oscar the drummer, who dispatched first my poor mama, then Jan Bronski, my father, to their graves. But then, I am the inmate of a lunatic asylum. <laughs> In episode one of The Tin Drum by Gunter Grass, Phil Daniels played Oscar, Kenneth Cranham, Matt Zurat, and Leslie Manville, Agnes. Stephen Critchlow was Jan, David Collings, Bebra, and Jane Whittenshaw, Ross Vita. John Turner played Marcus, Paul Jenkins, Greff, and Kristen Millward, Gretchen. The Fisherman was played by John Hartley and the Midwife by Tessa Worsley. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Percussion was by Unman. The Tin Drum was adapted for radio by Mike Walker and directed by Peter Kavanagh. <laughs>